The next generation of consoles is on the way, and recently Sony revealed the PlayStation 5 with a blockbuster display of next generation games. There was so much here to be excited for. A new Spider-Man game featuring Miles Morales, Resident Evil 8, Horizon Forbidden West. There was so much it raised our hype levels to a boil, but there was one game that was missing. One installment in a franchise that just says PlayStation. A game that fans have been screaming for a peek at for years now. Where was PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale 2, you cowards? You know, the, uh, the build-up to that bait-and-switch joke probably would have worked better if the title of this video wasn't Build the Roster PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale 2, huh? Oh well, too late now, roll the intro. Yes, welcome back to Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And last time, we did a massive two-part look at Marvel vs. Capcom 4, a game that many fans are salivating at the idea of, a game that is at the top of the fighting game community's wish list. And since then, I have had plenty of people contacting me about what they want the next episode to be on. Capcom vs. SNK 3, Tekken Cross Street Fighter, Persona 5 Arena, so many great ideas to choose from. So, of course, I decided to go with a sequel to a game that most people have already forgotten existed, and even when it was announced, was met with overwhelming... WHAT?! Yes, with excitement for the PlayStation 5 still palpable, I figured now was probably the only good time I would ever have to take a look at PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale, dear god, that name is too long. For anyone who doesn't remember what this was, PlayStation was going to try and fight back against Nintendo's beloved Smash Bros. series, a platform fighting game franchise where you play as some of the biggest and brightest characters in Nintendo's library, with their own platform fighter featuring some of their biggest characters. And I know it had some people excited, but I remember when this was announced, most people were just... confused. I mean, when you think of Nintendo's characters and PlayStation's characters, yeah, they don't really feel like people who would go to the same parties. So seeing PlayStation characters, many of whom were far more humanoid or realistic or darker in nature, now in a colorful platform fighter picking up items and jumping and flying around, it felt like going to a high school football game and the kids from Stranger Things walk out into the field while the quarterback and his starting lineup are at home playing Dungeons and Dragons. It just felt weird. However, I'll be honest with you, I did pick the game up when I bought a Vita. Yes, I owned a Vita, I'm not proud of it. And I have to admit, I actually liked it. I mean, yes, it still had its problems. Ooh, did it have problems. The whole, you can only knock your opponent out with super moves that take forever to build up, and many of these moves only work in very specific situations, was a huge mistake. I give them credit for trying to not just copy the way that you KO'd characters in Smash Bros and trying to be their own thing, but ooh, ooh, if this game ever comes back, that needs to be fixed. But the game overall was actually mostly enjoyable. There was enough here that I actually could see them one day returning to it. It's not likely, but if it ever does happen, I would be intrigued to see what comes from it. However, if this game franchise ever does return to us, there was something else that needed to be fixed. Do you know what was? I'll give you a hint. It's in the title of the show that you're watching right now. Yes, the roster. As I said, it was weird picturing some of PlayStation's icons in a platform fighter, but that doesn't mean PlayStation didn't have a busload of memorable characters to roll up with. But when you saw the final roster, it was just... Okay? Not... Okay! And not... Okay. No, just... Okay? With a big question mark at the end. Because this roster... Well... It wasn't bad. It did have enough good picks in there, but... 
wow, were there some picks that were just weird. And I don't mean good weird. If you guys have followed me for long enough, you know I'm a fan of the good weird picks. Your roster needs that. You can't just have the faces. You need the freaks in there to get people talking. But these weird picks weren't good. They were just weird. And even if there were some picks who were obvious, there were some other obvious picks who were totally absent. When this roster came out, everyone asked, where were characters A, B, and C? And don't get me wrong, that will always happen for any fighting game roster. No matter how good it is, people will always ask, where are characters A, B, and C? Except normally, everyone has their own A, B, and C. Normally, everyone has their own characters that they think are obvious, but not everyone else is going to agree. But with PlayStation All-Stars, everyone had the exact same A, B, and C. They were that obvious. And just to top it off, there was that small dash of sleaze thrown in there as well. That tiny little whiff of corporate ew thrown in. Why was Dante not the version of the character who had helped to build the PS2's library with multiple exclusive games, and why was it going to be the reboot version who wasn't a PlayStation exclusive and his game hadn't even come out yet? And I know Infamous was big at the time, but why did no series get more than one character except for Infamous where it was just the good and bad version of the same character? This roster, again, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't good. And it kind of fell right into that salty spot that made people look at it and go, Oh, I'm probably going to forget about that as soon as I look away from it. So you know what? Let's get nuts today. Let's pretend the head of Sony wakes up one morning, takes the wrong combination of medication by mistake, and now in a dizzy haze, they get the insane idea to make a sequel to this game, and now we're tasked with building the roster. But before we start bringing together our all-stars, we have to ask the most important question when constructing a roster. How many characters? PlayStation All-Star Battle, ugh, this is going to be a long video if I have to keep saying that full name. This game had a roster of 20 characters, which again, for the first installment in a crossover franchise is... Okay, I mean, it could be larger, but could be smaller too, I guess. Yeah, again, just right there in that sweet spot to not be good, but not make you mad enough to keep talking about. But of course, for this sequel, we're going to have to take that number up. But what's the realistic number to throw out? Again, I don't want to just come in here and say, make it 99 characters and turn into a triple A version of Mugen. No, got to think about the people working on it. Got to think about the resources being dedicated to it. We need to try and be realistic here. So how did I decide how many characters to add? Simple. I looked at the competition. This game is clearly trying to get in on that Smash Bros popularity, and Smash Bros roster has continued to grow with each game. The first game had 12 characters, then Melee had 26, so that's an increase of 14. Then Brawl had 39, so that's an increase of 13. Then Smash 4 had 51, so that's only 12. But then you remember it had 7 DLC characters, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm only looking at the starting roster. And Smash Ultimate brought everyone back, so I don't even feel like that works for this equation. It's its own beast. So you have an increase of 14, 13, and 12. In other words, averaging out to 13, which means we're going to be going from 20 up to 33 for All Stars 2. But then I had to remind myself, oh, right, this game had DLC. It had four characters as DLC, so I didn't know if I should factor them in. Did I count this as 20 or 24 characters? So I decided to split it right down the middle, call it 22 characters, mean 22 plus 13 is 35. <gasps> but then you remember that one of the staples of this game, as well as one of the only things that people actually liked from the first game, were the rival battles, meaning we would have two characters face off with each other in a cinematic fight, meaning that you would need an even number of characters, so either we need to round up to 36 or round down to 34, and considering that we need to win people back and the series that we're competing against just had a game that has a starting roster of over 70 characters, going higher is always the more appealing option, so that brings us up to 36. Holy crap, figuring out the starting roster to the sequel to a game that most people forgot even existed should not involve this much research and math. 
So, that means that we're going to be taking 22 characters straight from the last game and then adding 14 new ones, right? Well, no. This isn't Smash Ultimate. Not everyone is here because, real talk, not everyone from the last game should be here. However, most of them will be returning. I'm still keeping 16 from the previous 24. Not because of any weird equation, because I think we have had enough of those for one video, but because I went through the entire list and that's just who I was left with. So while it might be quicker to tell you who isn't returning, let's go through each of them individually to try and cover all of our bases. Going in alphabetical order, we'll start with Big Daddy from Bioshock. And I'm glad we're starting here because it brings me to a point I really wanted to make and we should go ahead and get out of the way now. I am all for guest characters in your fighting game. Love them. But I feel like when this is a crossover game meant to focus on a specific theme and this is only going to be the second installment in your franchise, yeah, we need to stick to that theme. And the theme of PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale is that it's characters specifically linked to PlayStation. It's kind of right there in the name. I mean, Smash Bros was all about Nintendo characters and they eventually did expand to have it be just famous video game characters in general, which was great, but they still waited until the third installment to start expanding. And yes, Big Daddy, while I love him, he was a really cool addition to this game. He has nothing to do with PlayStation. I mean, yes, Bioshock is on the PlayStation, but it came out on the PlayStation literally a year after it came out on the Xbox. If it was reversed, then heck yeah, absolutely. I would say he belongs in here, but instead, this guy was an Xbox exclusive for a year before coming to the PlayStation, so no, I can't see him fitting the theme well enough, and yeah, I think we need to kick him. I hate doing it, trust me I do, but I can't justify him being in here. Okay. Now that we've gotten what will arguably be the toughest band-aid of this whole video ripped off, let's keep going. Next up, Cole McGrath. Yeah, let's keep him on. The Infamous series is not as big as it used to be, and heck, Cole isn't even in those games anymore, but he was one of the big faces of the PS3 era. However, there will only be one Cole McGrath. We don't need the good and bad versions as two slots. That is a palette swap, and that's it. Yes, I know he gains different powers in each version, don't care. Not worth taking up a second slot. Colonel Raddick from Killzone. This one was tough, because I will admit that I have never really touched the Killzone franchise. I know it is a long-running PlayStation exclusive with a strong fan base. In fact, just to test this out, I went on Twitter and asked how many people were still Killzone fans, and I got a decent number of replies. But each of those replies basically said, yeah, I love Killzone. I would love another installment. But the series is pretty much dead. Not saying that you can't bring in characters from a dead franchise. Trust me, I will have plenty of those. But it did kind of hurt Raddick's chances. Also, in this big crazy collection of characters, Raddick pretty much just fights with guns. So I always found him to be less interesting than some of the other characters. So... Even though I know it's God's fans, yeah, he's out. Next, Dante from Devil May Cry. Yes, but ha 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 ha, not this guy. Yeah, this should go without saying, but classic Dante was one of the big phases of PlayStation 2 exclusives, while his reboot version was non-exclusive, appeared in Battle Royale before his game even came out, and there's the matter that people... How can I phrase this? didn't really like him. So yeah, reboot Dante is out, classic Dante is in. Next, our first DLC character, Emmett Graves from Starhawk. I think he had an interesting playstyle in the game, but that's all he had going for him. Just like with Killzone, I went online and asked if Starhawk still had a strong fan base, and unlike Killzone, I was met with So, yeah, he's out. Next up, Fat Princess. <sighs> yes, absolutely. All right, 
Next to Big Daddy, this one is probably my most controversial opinion, so let me explain. I almost didn't put her in here because I feel like out of all the characters from All-Stars 1, she probably raised the most questions. I think her inclusion was the one that made the most people shout, what? Yeah, she was a weird pick. And as I said, there wasn't really a lot of good weird picks. Really, the only reason she was in here was to be the representative for PlayStation's exclusive indie games, which PlayStation wasn't really that serious about. And today, their dedication to that has dropped even more. However, as I thought about her for the list, I started to see way more positives for her. Positives that, oddly, were shaped not by her own game, but by the first All-Stars. As I said, I didn't think she was a good example of a weird pick, but as time went on, I saw so many people talking about her in this game. Again, not saying, oh, that's cool, I really like playing as her, but more of just saying, can you believe Fat Princess got in this game? And now that I look back at it, I realize this was a game that not many people talked about. But they sure talked about her. The confusion over her inclusion probably gave this game more free advertising than they ever thought it would. And because of that, in many ways, I would actually argue that she's gone on to become the face of PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale. Whenever I see someone do a video on this game, they always slap her face right on the title card. In fact, kind of like Mr. Game & Watch or the Ice Climbers, I would say that she is now more known for being in this game than for being in her own game. Her own game that's even named after her. So in a very bizarre turn of events, I actually think Fat Princess went from being a bad weird pick to being a good weird pick. Boy, who thought that would be the character that we got the most discussion from? All right, time to pick up the pace. Eihachi Mishima, he's pretty much the face of Tekken, which for many installments was the PlayStation exclusive fighting game series, so he stays. Next, another DLC character, Isaac Clarke. Listen, I love horror games, and Dead Space and Dead Space 2 are some of my favorites. Both are in my top 10, but they're not PlayStation exclusives. The closest this has to being tied to PlayStation is that the PS3 release of Dead Space 2 included a remaster of Dead Space Extraction, and that's pretty much it. And you don't even play as Isaac in Extraction. So that's not enough for me to justify Isaac returning. So just like Big Daddy, he's another character that I love that I'm forced to cut. Just wanted to remind everyone, I always try to make these as unbiased as possible. Next, Jack and Daxter. Yeah, obviously, one of the biggest mascots of the PS2 era of games. Next, another DLC character, Cat from Gravity Rush. Absolutely bring her back. Gravity Rush might not be a huge hit, but it is certainly a cult classic. The fans of that series are diehards, and you need those characters with diehard fan bases in your crossover games because diehard fans tend to buy up whatever game their characters appear in. Plus, the series is a PlayStation exclusive, and her gravity altering powers could be very fun to play around with. Next up, Kratos. This is a big no duh. This guy is practically Mr. PlayStation. In fact, if you even look at the Metacritic scores for each of these PlayStation exclusive franchises, his evened out to being the highest, so he has to make it in. Next up, Nariko from Heavenly Sword. Yeah, this is a big no. And that's just it, it's just a big no. I know that Heavenly Sword was meant to show off how amazing the PS3 was, so it does have some importance to PlayStation's history, but yeah, everyone has forgotten about this. It totally failed to take off, so sorry, she's out. Nathan Drake, another big no duh. If Kratos is Mr. PlayStation, then Nathan Drake is the runner up for that title. The Uncharted series is one of the biggest franchises in PlayStation's history, and I know earlier I said that I found guys who just use guns to be kind of boring in these big zany platform fighters, but Drake has his agility, he's got props to throw, and most importantly, he's got his big dynamic personality. So heck yes, put him in. Parappa the Rapper, a beloved figure from the early days of the PlayStation's history, and also a very different figure from these other characters on this list with a fun music-loving personality, I think he still deserves to stick around. Raiden, now this is kind of a weird one because he's from Metal Gear, and Metal Gear, yeah, it was a PlayStation exclusive series for a long while, so I would definitely count him as a possibility, but rumors have it that Konami really doesn't like the idea of any of Kojima's old characters appearing in anything. 
so we might not be able to get him. But since this is right in from Metal Gear Revengeance, a game that feels very separated from the other Metal Gear games, and he is a legacy character, he was in the first game, I think we're safe. He still has a shot at being in, so for the time being, I'm going to keep him around. Ratchet and Clank, absolutely. Everything I said about Jack and Daxter apply to them and then some. They were big icons of the PS2 era and they still, to this day, have new games coming out that people are excited for. Sackboy, this is a platform fighter. Sackboy is from Little Big Planet, a game where you literally create platform-based video game levels and he's got a new game coming out. So yeah, Sackboy is back, boy. Sir Daniel Fortescue from Medieval. Remember how I said this game had some weird picks, but I didn't really think any of them were good weird picks? You know what? I'm going to take that back. The more I think about it, the more I realize Sir Daniel was a good weird pick. Medieval was a cult classic with fans who thought fondly of it, and it was closely associated with the PlayStation, but the series was, no pun intended, kinda dead. So when he popped up in the first All-Stars, it is what I would consider to be a good weird pick. But last year, his game came back with a remaster, so now he's got all those pauses from before, combined with being back in the public eye for the first time in a couple decades. So yes, for this hypothetical sequel, Sir Daniel will rise again. Sly Cooper, just like Jack and Daxter, just like Ratchet and Clank, Sly is one of the big mascots of the PS2 era of these games, and when you look at all of the PlayStation 2 era platformer games, he actually had some of the best reviewed games in that collection, so Sly returns. Spike from Ape Escape. Okay, I know that the Ape Escape series feels like it might be dead, but as I've said, even if a series is dead, it can still be in these games if it's got a strong enough fan base, and the Ape Escape fans are still really strong. Heck, they have spent the last two years staring over at that Crash Bandicoot and Spyro and Medieval remakes, just licking their lips saying, so, so we're next, right? Seriously, we, we have to be next at this point. No, no SpongeBob? SpongeBob is the next one to get an HD remake? Okay. But I mean, like, after him, right, we're next? So maybe putting Spike back in here could help grease those remaster wheels a bit. Also, just throwing it out there, but maybe we could make one half of Spike's costumes Jimmy, the protagonist from Ape Escape 2, since they play almost exactly the same. Next is Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal, again, another series that is pretty much gone, but it was important to the history of the PlayStation, and Sweet Tooth is certainly an explosive personality, so for those two reasons, he will be returning. Next up, another weird pick, Toro who is essentially just a mascot for the PlayStation in Japan. As I said, this game doesn't really have many good weird picks, and Toro feels like he could have been a good weird pick if this roster was a few slots bigger. Some obscure cat that only means something to people in Japan and barely has any actual games of its own? Sure, sounds like a good far out there grab, except when you think about all the characters that didn't make it into this game, yeah, it isn't worth it. He goes from being a potentially good weird pick to now just being a thing that's taking up a roster slot. So yeah, sadly, Toro, the karate martial arts ogre cat, I'm not even really sure what he is, guys. Anyway, this guy, he's not going to be returning. At least not as a fighter. I'd still put him and his counterpart Koro in the game, but maybe just as the characters who welcome you and explain the tutorial or run the end game shop or gallery, certainly keep them in the game, but I wouldn't want to see them as fighters. Then again, maybe I'm just biased because I remember how freaking broken their hitboxes were in Street Fighter Cross Tekken, but that's neither here nor there. And the final character from the original, and also the final DLC character, Zeus from God of War. As I said, God of War is probably the biggest PlayStation exclusive series out there, so it does make sense that it was the only series to get more than one character in here. I mean, that wasn't just a copy and paste. And this brings up the other big point I wanted to make for the roster. Kinda weird how the two points I wanted to make were perfectly highlighted by the first character and the last character from the returning roster, huh? But I do think it was kind of... okay? Question mark? that the first game mostly put in only one representative for each franchise. I mean, I get it, you get more franchises in here that way, 
But that would be like if Smash Bros. said, okay, we got Mario, but Luigi, Peach, Bowser, and Yoshi, all you hit the bricks. Only one character per game. That's it. Link, you're good. But Zelda and Ganon, sorry. Yeah, it just kind of feels like you're needlessly limiting your potential by doing that. So we're about to get into the new characters, and I am going to try and put in more characters from these series, but to still provide variety, I'm going to limit myself to two characters per series max. And I already have a character to add from the God of War franchise, who is a way better pick than Zeus, so yeah, sorry, he's not making it. So there you have it, out of the 24 old characters, 16 will be returning. Comograph, Dante, Fat Princess, Heihachi Mishima, Jack and Daxter, Cat, Kratos, Nathan Drake, Parappa the Rapper, Ryan, Ratchet and Clank, Sackboy, Sir Daniel Fortescue, Sly Cooper, Spike, and Sweet Tooth. Great. Now that that's out of the way, let's move on to... The Honorable Mentions. Yes, before we begin counting down the new characters, there's a lot of characters I know people are probably expecting to show up who will sadly be absent. I looked at many people's dream rosters to try and gauge who people would want to return for a sequel, and on almost everyone's list, I saw several contenders I thought, oh, oh no, that wouldn't work at all. Not because I thought that they were bad ideas, but because I always try to be at least a bit realistic for these rosters, and, well, I don't think we can get everyone we might want in here. So before we can dig into the fun stuff, Here's the unfortunate slice of legally complicated pie. What's going on? Snake! Snake! Snake. As I said, Metal Gear Solid was a huge PlayStation series back in the day, and a very important series for video games in general. But as I said, I know it's just rumors, but we've heard that Konami is trying to bury any of the characters that Kojima created or was closely associated with. Raiden, we could probably get in for how different Revengeance was, and because he has a legacy with this game, but Snake might be asking too much. And I know you're all about to say, but Snake came back for Smash Bros. Again, it's just rumors, but apparently Sakurai had to pull a lot of strings to make that happen. He had to use some personal connections, call in some favors, and use his own influence in the industry to get Konami to sign off on that. And I don't know if anyone who would be working on PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale 2 would have that same level of influence. So I'm just going to assume that he can't make it. For those same reasons, I will not be including Sam Porter Bridges. Death Stranding was a big game for the PS4 that people spent years looking forward to, and as odd as it might sound, I could see several mechanics that would make Sam an interesting fighter. Let him pick up packages and pile them on his back to increase his defense, but then he could get rid of them by throwing them as an attack, making him a real risk and reward style character. But A, Sam's appearance is literally just actor Norman Reedus, so there's probably all kinds of legal problems with including him, and B, he is Hideo Kojima's baby, and if Konami found out that we were including him in this game, they might pull out any potential characters of theirs. So in this one and only this one instance, I am going to side with Konami over Hideo Kojima. Ugh. Just saying that made me feel dirty. Ellie and Joel from The Last of Us. I know The Last of Us games are some of the most critically acclaimed games in PlayStation's history, and Naughty Dog is already letting us use a lot of characters for this game, so it wouldn't be out of the question to ask them for another. But if I had to think of two characters who absolutely do not fit the tone of a crazy zany platform fighter, it is Ellie and Joel from The Last of Us. I mean, that series is meant to be so serious that the developers even had to say this game isn't meant to be fun. So I can't picture them now being thrown into what would essentially be a party fighting game. I mean, what would their level 3 super be? They befriend a character, hang out with them, get to know them, then that character gets bitten by a zombie, and now you have a tear felt goodbye as Ellie has to put a bullet in Sly Cooper's head? Yeah, no, I just can't see that working. Hell, as I said, the people behind this game even wanted to make it clear this game is not supposed to be fun, 
So even if we asked them to let Ellie and Joel be in this game, they'd probably say no. Speaking of characters I just couldn't see working in here, the prince from Katamari Damacy. I think this series is a blast, and it is indeed a fan favorite among PlayStation owners, but no matter how hard I tried to picture it, I just couldn't think of how the prince would play in this game. I mean, he really only does one thing. He rolls a ball. Sometimes he charges with that ball, but that's about it. I am a big believer that when it comes to crossover games, no character is off the table. Every single character can make it in. If Phoenix Wright can be in Marvel vs. Capcom, then nobody is too out there. You can make everyone work, but I just couldn't figure it out. Someone smarter than me can probably come up with something, but I just, I, 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 I was flabbergasted on this one. I got nothing, folks. Sora from Kingdom Hearts. I know this one will hurt because man oh man do the Kingdom Hearts fans want Sora in a crossover game bad. Hell, I'm not even a Kingdom Hearts fan and I want him in a crossover game. His whole series is about going to other worlds. It just makes sense. And he is a huge icon of PlayStation exclusive games. He absolutely deserves it. Just, uh, um, one problem. Woof! You don't <laughs> talk to me like that! Yeah, again, this is all rumors, but apparently Sakurai tried to get Sora for Smash Bros, and Disney Japan told him no. And if Disney Japan won't let him be in Smash, they probably won't let him be in the Smash knockoff game. Speaking of Disney, Spider-Man. Yes, on every dream roster I saw for Battle Royale 2, I saw people putting Spider-Man down. Which actually does make some sense, since Spider-Man's PS4 game was a huge hit, both critically and monetarily. That game was amazing on almost every level. But again, to get him in here, you'd have to deal with Disney. But this time, you wouldn't be dealing with Disney Japan, you'd be dealing with Disney America, which actually might work in our favor. Because after that Spider-Man PS4 game succeeded so well, a representative for Disney's gaming department came out and said, yeah, we're going to give people more freedom. We're going to start letting more people use our characters in their games because this showed what that can accomplish. And when dealing with a company like Disney that is famous for being so restrictive with their characters, that is great to hear. Also, I would just like to take a moment real quick to say, Dear God, please let that Avengers game be good. Please let it sell well. Because if that thing flops, then Disney is going to pick up their toys and go home all over again, and nobody wants that. My point being, yes, there's a chance that maybe Disney America would actually be cool with putting Spidey in a crossover game. But not with no strings attached. If Spiny got into this game, they would have someone standing over this game's development for every single minute of it. This would be one of those too many cooks spoil the pot situation as I guarantee you Disney would want to make sure everything lined up for them. So even if it was possible, I don't think it's a smart idea to put Spidey in right now. Maybe as DLC when the game is already complete so that way Disney could already look at the product that has been created and they wouldn't have to double check everything as it's being made. But for the base roster, yeah, no. Plus, just to address the elephant in the room, Spidey isn't a video game character. He's a comic book character who just has some video games. Including him in this game would just feel completely out of place to me. Next, Tama. I know that Tama still to this day has big fans who want to see him return, but I don't think the outcry for him is as strong as, say, Ape Escape or Twisted Metal. If the roster was up to 40 characters, then sure, I would include him, but it isn't, so there were characters I felt had more fans behind them. Joker, the Persona series is another long-running PlayStation exclusive, and ever since Persona 3, each game has grown larger and larger in popularity, with Persona 5 being an explosive hit, one of the highest-selling JRPGs of the decade. But there are a lot of other great characters from Persona's history, and Joker already got in Smash Bros., so I thought it would be better to let Joker have Smash so we could get some other characters in here to help flesh out the franchise. And the final honorable mention, 
Knack. Oh, PlayStation. You really tried to sell Knack, didn't you? He was a character created pretty much solely to show off how many cubes the PlayStation 4 could fit on screen at once. But he was odd, and not very fun, and not very marketable. But as I said, PlayStation tried. They tried hard to make Knack a thing. So I still thought about putting him on here, but then I decided to keep him off for one reason. As I said, you need people to talk about your game, but sometimes talking about the game includes talking about what's not in the game. And for lack of a better term, Knack is going to be our Waluigi. That character that maybe 10% of the population wants in the game, but 80% is going to say they want him in because it's a meme. Because it's just funny to ask for Waluigi in Smash. That's Knack, baby. I guarantee you the moment that PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale 2 gets announced, the number one joke the internet is going to make is, oh, does that mean that Knack is going to be in? And then when he's not revealed, the internet will respond with more jokes. Where's Knack? Put Knack in Battle Royale, you cowards. He is the exact right level of strange and out there that the internet will grab onto him and laugh and laugh at the idea of him being in this game. And will keep talking about him being in here to make fun of it, unaware that they're actually providing the game with free advertising the entire time. Yeah, I may have overthought this way too much. But that's all for the honorable mentions. Time to move on to the 20 new characters. Rough landing. Hi, which way's the beach? Hmm. Huh? Hey, stop staring. Haven't you guys ever seen a dragon before? First off, let's get some obvious ones out of the way. Spyro. This was one of the big ones people were asking for. He helped to define the PlayStation 1. When people thought of that console, they thought of Spyro, and fans kept him alive for years, even when his games dried up. I feel like the whole reason why they left him out of the last game was because he hadn't seen any action in a while, but now we've got the Spyro Reignite collection, and that did indeed reignite many gamers' love for the Little Purple Dragon, while introducing new fans to the series. So yes, Spyro is a must for this game, plus he can fly, and this is a platformer game. Make him our Kirby and give him like five jumps, it'll be great. And speaking of classic PlayStation mascots who were mysteriously absent from the first game, Here comes a new challenger! Crash Bandicoot. This is a huge no-brainer. For about half a decade, Crash Bandicoot was Sony's Mario, their Sonic. He was the face of the PlayStation in its early days, and in many ways, helped that system establish an identity. It was insane that he was absent from the first game. Like Spyro, back then, Crash wasn't doing well. It had been years since he had been in a game, and even longer since he had been in a good game. But now, the remaster of his first three games, the Insane Collection, brought him back in a huge way. So much so that now he's got a brand new game coming, and I for one think it looks amazing. It looks like what I remember loving about Crash Bandicoot. So heck yeah, we're including Crash. Give him a spinning attack, fire Wampa Fruit, he can have a charge attack where he hops on a baby polar bear and dashes ahead, and for his level 3 super, he gets the Aku Aku mask on, and now whenever he runs into an opponent, he sends them flying off the screen. In fact, Crash is so big right now, we're not stopping with him. For our next fighter, we're throwing Coco into the mix. Yeah, I feel like she's been playable in enough games at this point that she deserves to be considered, and I know the Crash fans love her. Plus, she'd share some moves with Crash, so that way she'd be fairly easy to program. But because she uses so many gadgets, she could also have a solid chunk of variety to her. In fact, as I said, I do want to include more than one character per franchise, and I'm not stopping at Coco. There's a couple characters from the original cast whose series totally deserve a double dip, so let's go ahead and look at those characters now and get them out of the way. Here comes a new challenger! <sighs> 
Seems like I am always saving your ass. Chloe Frazier from Uncharted. Now, Chloe made it onto the list for the exact same reason why she almost didn't make it onto the list. I thought, okay, Uncharted was a massive hit for the PlayStation, so let's try and put another character in here from there, and Chloe made the most sense. I know some people would go with Elena, but Chloe is more of a fighter and adventurer than Elena. Plus, Chloe actually got her own spin-off game, showing that she can totally step into the spotlight. However, even though she made a lot of sense to me, I had to stop and think, yeah, but she basically played just like Nathan Drake, so maybe that's not a great idea? But then I stopped and remembered, oh right, this game is basically just Smash Bros. And Smash Bros. is 100% down with copying a character's playstyle and putting it on a new character. They even created a term for that, Echo Fighters. And they did this for a reason, because crossover games are fandom games, where the important thing isn't just what characters you can get in here, but also how many. And Echo Fighters let you squeeze in more characters without working your staff to the breaking point. So if we want to have a starting roster of 36 characters and we want to be realistic about it, we'll probably need to have at least a few of these characters be Echo Fighters, so let's make Chloe an Echo Fighter of Nathan Drake. Here comes a new challenger! Alright! Please welcome, all the way from the Solana Galaxy, Mr. Copernicus Quark! It's Captain Quark. I didn't take a three-week hero correspondence course to be called Mr. Easy on the goods, pal. Next character to double up on from a previous franchise, Captain Quark. Yes, as you can tell from the characters we've already covered, PlayStation has a wide selection of console-exclusive platformers, and each of them is a load with characters with huge personalities, and that's the exact reason why I'm picking Captain Quark. His personality. He's a big braggadocious joke who thinks he's the greatest hero the universe has ever seen. He's the family-friendly version of Zap Brannigan. I want this guy in here just for the windscreen quotes alone. And yes, I know the last game didn't have windscreen quotes, but I'm going to add them in here because this game, as I said, is a fandom fighter. It's all about showing off these characters' personalities. In fact, The Last All-Stars didn't really have too many moments of crossover fun, but it did have some with the rival battles, where characters would have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with their opponent, and those were great. And I want to load this game up with even more of that. And if there's one character I'd love to see interacting with a super serious Kratos or Sweet Tooth or Cole or heck, really anybody, it's Captain Quark. I just want to see how far out of his element he can get while still trying to be all cool and collect. Think of him as being like this game's version of Dan Hibiki or Johnny Cage. Yes, he would have specials that would include things like punches or ray gun blasts, but he would also have specials that include things like a long string of taunts or throwing an autograph at the opponent. Moves and abilities that are just here to let Captain Quark be Captain Quark, because again, this is a fandom fighter. You want to load it with as much personality as you can get. Here comes a new challenger. I certainly wasn't expecting her to crash the party. She'd been so busy with her latest case, I never thought she'd have her eye on me. In fact, I'd kind of been counting on it. But then, I should have known better than to underestimate Inspector Carmelita Fox. And the last character from a previous series I'm doubling up on, Carmelita Fox from Sly Cooper. Listen, I'm starting to run out of ways to say fan favorite character, but that's exactly what she is. Sly Cooper has that strong cult following. It was a critically acclaimed series from start to finish, and out of all the characters in that series, Carmelita Fox, Sly's eternal rival constantly trying to bring the thieving raccoon to justice, was one of the most beloved characters in that game. Heck, she even appeared as a stage hazard in the last game, which, by the way, we're not going to pitch any ideas for the stages in this video, but can I just go ahead and applaud the last game for its stages? All-Stars did a lot of things wrong, or just okay, but the stages that started in one world and then had another franchise burst in to create stage hazards was amazing. If you watched our Marvel vs. Capcom 4 video and saw the stages that we pitched in there, yeah, I totally just stole the idea for the changing stages straight from this game. They're genius. So yes, Carmelia Fox was from a beloved series and was a fan favorite character, and as a cop sworn to bring in thieves, 
I would love to see her go up against Nathan Drake or have an ending where she arrests all the racers from Twisted Metal. All right, let's get back to some new franchises, including another one that people were screaming for in the first game. Here comes a new challenger. Get down here, Merc. Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII. Yes, I know that I said I wasn't going to put Joker in here because he got into Smash, so we're going to use this opportunity to focus on some other Persona characters, and Cloud is also in Smash, and there are indeed way more Final Fantasy characters who deserve a chance to shine, but come on. We're talking about characters important to the history of PlayStation. We have to include Cloud Strife. It cannot be overstated how important Final Fantasy VII was to the PlayStation 1. I was a kid when that game came out, and I can tell you, that was like a spiritual event for gamers. I would be willing to say about half the fans of JRPGs around my age got into JRPGs because of that game, or because of another game that came out riding on the popularity of Final Fantasy VII. And games like Crash and Spyro helped the PlayStation establish an identity, but Final Fantasy VII helped it pull ahead and become a juggernaut. In fact, to this day, if you want to play a JRPG, the PlayStation is your go-to console, and you have Final Fantasy VII to thank for that. Is it the best Final Fantasy game? Hey, everyone will have a different answer to that, but everyone can agree, this was probably the most important for the series' popularity. And now is even the perfect time for the PlayStation to celebrate him, because earlier this year, the Final Fantasy VII Remake came out and, uh... Well, to say that got people excited for more of these characters is an understatement. In fact, Final Fantasy VII was so important to the PlayStation, and the Final Fantasy VII Remake is so big right now, he's not even the only character I'm including from that game. Here comes a new challenger! Tifa Lockhart. I know, I know, someone out there is going to say, okay, I can give you Cloud, but your second Final Fantasy character is also from Final Fantasy VII? I call shenanigans. I know, listen, I know that I just got done praising Final Fantasy VII, but I will admit, I do think that game gets way too much attention compared to its brothers and sisters. I personally wish more people talked about 9, I think 12 is super underrated, and I can only dream that one day people will remember how good 10 was, or heck, remember anything about Final Fantasy X beyond just that laughing scene that turned into a meme. But if I went with another game, I'd probably have to go with the protagonist of that game, and well, then our options come down to Sword Guy, Tiny Sword Guy, Sword Guy, Sword Guy, Sword Lady, and multiple sword guy. We need somebody who plays differently, so that means one of the supporting characters. And Tifa doesn't fight with a weapon, she is a weapon. She's a brawler who would get up close and personal, and I'd be willing to say out of all the supporting characters in the Final Fantasy series, she's easily gotta be in the top five most popular. And again, considering that the Final Fantasy VII Remake has got everyone talking about that game again, yeah, I kind of have to pick her. Plus, I would love to see her supers be her limit breaks from the game. How cool would it be if she did a dolphin blow and actually sent a dolphin flying up hitting anyone it touches? And as I said, I would love to bring in some crossover fun in here, such as bringing back the rival battles. And with Tifa being one of the best brawlers in RPG history, I would love for her rival battle to be her going up against another famous punching machine. Imagine her rival battle. Start with her walking down an alleyway, seeing someone beating the snot out of a group of people, and she races in to stop him, smacking her fist against his and being stunned at how skilled of a fighter he seems to be, remarking that he might even be as good as she is. Who is this mysterious rival, you ask? Here comes a new challenger!
今日はこちらに一体どんな御用すがいと話がしたいだがお前らの案内は無用だそこをどけカズマキリュウ from Yakuza Yeah, I'll admit this was one of the last candidates to make it onto the list because, honestly, I don't think of Yakuza as being a PlayStation series because it just feels like it's grown in identity that goes beyond any one console. But when I sat down and actually looked at it, yeah, almost every installment in this very long series has been either PlayStation exclusive or at least timed exclusive. And it might have taken a while to catch on here in the West, but now Yakuza is a huge worldwide hit. It's one of Sega's biggest series. And a lot of that comes from the dragon of Dojima himself, Kazuma Kiryu, the mob muscle man with a heart of gold. Put him in here and have him play like the ultimate brawler with a wide range of big swinging punches. Maybe for some extra added flair, whenever you do a special move on an opponent, money would go flying out of them as he knocks them across the screen. His level 1 super would be a grab, where after he gets his hands on the enemy, he would then go into a heat action to finish them off. For his level 2, he would pick up a motorcycle. Not to ride it, but so that he could carry it around for a limited amount of time and beat his opponents with it. And for his level 3, he would prepare to attack, only to hear. Kirita! As he'd look behind him to see Goro Majima jumping out to attack. Kazuma would sidestep Majima, grabbing him and throwing him at the opponents. And then Majima would continue to run after Kazuma for a limited amount of time, slicing up any enemy that got between the two of them and instantly KOing them. And since Majima is a master of disguise, maybe for added effect, when he jumps out at you, he could be disguised as another character from this game. Just picture Goro Majima pouncing out at you wearing a big foam crash bandicoot costume. It's too good and too perfect for his character. And as I said, Yakuza is a big hit for Sega. But do you know what's another franchise that's been a big hit for Sega and for the PlayStation? Here comes a new challenger! So. No! Yu Narukami from Persona 4. I love the Persona series, and Persona 5 is indeed the current hotness, but Persona 4 was the ruler of that franchise for almost a decade. For eight years, Atlas would put out one release for Persona 4 after another. Either a re release, a spin off, an enhanced edition, they milked that game to the bone. And that wasn't just good for Atlas and Sega, it was good for the PlayStation. I would be willing to say that about 25% of all the sales of the Vita came from the fact that Persona 4 Golden, the enhanced edition of that game with new scenes and characters, was a Vita exclusive. I mean, hell, I'll admit, that's why I own one. And after you played through that a few times and you thought to yourself, well, there's nothing left for me here, I guess I can put my Vita away in storage now. Then they released the Persona 4 dancing game as a Vita exclusive. Yes, there was a Persona 4 dancing game, and yes, I can't believe that was a thing either. But it was. And people bought it. And they bought the collector's edition. And yes, I'm talking about myself, let's move on. So, yes, the swag master of voiceless protagonists is coming back, and he will be our first Persona character. That's right, I said our first character. Because Persona 4 might have been when the franchise exploded, but the spark of the modern day Persona fandom was lit with Persona 3. Here comes a new challenger! No! I make my living as an elevator attendant, but I know several effective ways of inflicting pain. Don't worry, I'm not as fragile as I look. Try to kill me if you can. Elizabeth from Persona 3. I know some of you might have expected me to go with the protagonist of three, but we already have one blank face protagonist. We don't need to. Plus, he's not even close to being the biggest breakout star of that series. No, that has to be Elizabeth, the bizarre and completely aloof elevator attendant with the powers of a god. Her personality would be great to see clash with some of these other characters. 
As someone who barely has a grasp on reality, but loves to learn and completely misunderstand every aspect of it, you know she would have some amazing win quotes against these characters. Heck, with her aloof personality and somewhat near-infinite power and knowledge, she could be the only character in this game to break the fourth wall completely and remark on how this game is basically just a rip-off of Smash Bros. So I stole... I mean... Borrowed that idea. Maybe if she beats you, Narakami, her win quote could be something along the lines of, hmm, maybe I'll try facing that other guest of the Velvet Room. Oh, no, I suppose he's already playing another game right now. Plus, whereas Narakami would probably just use his main persona, Izanagi, Elizabeth possesses the persona compendium, meaning she could bring out a dozen personas, one for each special attack and super, making her one of the most visually impressive and striking characters in the game. But alright, enough of the niche characters, time to go back to some fighters who just scream PlayStation. Here comes a new challenger! Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. This one was so obvious, I should probably just have started the video with it. I mean, you all saw it coming. This game was a huge hit for Sony. After just one game, Aloy is already being put up next to Kratos and Nathan Drake on PlayStation's Mount Rushmore. Have her fight using her arrows and other weapons, and for each of her supers, have her summon out one of the big beasts from her game, implying that she's hacking into them so that they'll fight by her side, with her level 3 summoning out the Stormbird, basically meaning she would get to have the Rathalos assist from Smash Bros just totally unique to her. Aloy is so big that I feel like I need to say more about her. But have you owned a PlayStation in the last three years? Yeah, you know she deserves this spot. Here comes a new challenger. That's me. My name is Abe. I was employee of the year. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm dead meat. Abe from Oddworld. The Oddworld games were another franchise unique to PlayStation, and who boy was unique the right word. This game wasn't like anything else, and not just because of its freaky character design. It wasn't really an action-heavy game, it was more of a puzzle platformer where you have to solve riddles to get through a stage because Abe couldn't exactly take a hit. You had to use your brain more than your brawn, so because of that, I almost didn't put him in here because just like the prince from Katamari Damacy, I had no idea how to put him in a fighting game. But I could see him almost playing as a more morbid version of Olimar from Smash Bros, where instead of pulling Pikmin out of the ground to fight with, Abe would summon out other Madokans to fight alongside him, or even take possession of another character in the game as one of his big supers. It would be kind of tricky, but considering what an impact he had on the PlayStation 1's life, and the fact that his franchise is finally returning to usher in the PlayStation 5, he totally deserves a spot, so we can figure out some way to make him work. Here comes a new challenger! The Hunter from Bloodborne. I know it might be weird to put a creative character onto the list, but again, that doesn't stop Smash Bros from doing it, so it won't stop us. And Bloodborne was a huge hit for the PlayStation. It was pretty much the first PlayStation 4 exclusive that really got that system selling. Sorry, Knack. You could give them a system where if they get hit, then they can regain some of that health if they attack back quickly enough, just like in their game. Or they can have a counterattack where they fire a gun at your opponent and stun them, allowing the hunter to go in and pull off a visceral attack. Aside from that, most of their specials would be their various spells or weapons from the game, such as Molotovs or their comedically large pizza cutter. You know the one. Their supers were a little tricky to figure out, but here's what I'm picturing. For their level 1, they could throw a blood cocktail at the opponent. If it hit them, then they would be stunned, and the blood-starved beast would pop up behind them and instantly KO them. For their level 2, I could see them ringing a summoning bell to bring in one of the NPCs from the game who would quickly run across the stage attacking anyone in their path. And for their level 3, an invisible amygdala would be summoned onto the field, hanging against the wall, and occasionally you would see that big black hole run across the screen, and any opponent grabbed by it would be lifted up and crushed. 
And one last note, if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, this sounds nice, but I really want to see some more of the flavor of Bloodborne in their moves. Don't worry, because if we get the Hunter in here, then you know we would get a Yarnum stage, which, honestly, is about 50% of the reason why I chose them. Now, speaking of Bloodborne and other Souls-like games... Here comes a new challenger! In the heat of battle... true meaning of struggle. I stand ready to battle demons. I stand as a samurai. William from Neo. Neo is another one of those games that I don't really think of as being a PlayStation exclusive, but when it came to consoles, yeah, it's a PlayStation exclusive all right. And even though it is on the PC, it took almost a year to get there, so it absolutely counts. He'd be another sword fighter, but each of his special moves would see him pulling out the various other weapons from the game. For his level 1 and level 3 supers, I could see him summoning out one of his guardian spirits, with his level 1 being used for a quick attack, while his level 3 follows him around for a while for a continuous attack. But for his level 2 super, which tends to be a super that covers a medium size area or sticks around for just a little while, maybe he could summon some miasma onto the ground. In his game, the miasma trains your key, which is basically your stamina, but in here the miasma could sit in one area of the field for a while and any opponent who steps in there would move slowly and they would be instantly KO'd if they're attacked inside of it. That is if we're still going with the supers instantly KO opponents route, which we probably won't do, but that's a discussion for someone else to have. We're just here for the roster. Also, remember how All Stars lets you customize fighters with little chibi supporting characters? Yeah, it was weird but screw it it was fun so we're gonna bring it back and when it comes to william he already has the perfect character the kodamas they're already the exact right size for the job they work way too well and you know something while we're talking about famous playstation samurais here comes a new challenger <laughs>名府から蘇った伝説の武者クロードさんさ。カジバの火を焚き、再び小松が誇る武具を鍛えよう。そうすれば直ちに伝説のクロード。悪くないだろう。Jin Sakai, aka The Ghost, from Ghost of Tsushima. I almost didn't put Jin on the list because I thought that he was too new. I mean, his game literally came out while I was editing this video, so in order for me to go back and redo this whole thing and take someone else off the list, his game would have to be really good. Spoiler alert, his game is really good. And it's a hit! It's one of, if not the, fastest selling original property in PlayStation's history. Plus, if Sony decided to work on this All-Stars game now, it would be about two years before it came out, so, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that whole two new thing would be a moot point by then. Now, as for how he'd play, again, I'm going to take some inspiration from Smash Bros and actually say he would be similar to Shulk which is probably the only time anyone will compare these two. You know how in Smash Bros, Shulk can switch around the properties of his sword to give him different abilities as he fights? Well, in Ghost of Tsushima, Jin has four different stances, each good against a different type of enemy. So, give him a similar ability where he can swap stances to give him different power-ups during the game. And for his supers, level one would be his lightning slash for a quick instant kill. Level 2 could see him summoning out some of his allies from the game to fire arrows from across the screen. And for his level 3, he would of course go into his ghost stance, where he would instantly KO any opponent he slashes for a limited amount of time. Here comes a new challenger! You're all seeing what's up on the screen, you're all hearing that music, so I know where many of your heads are already at. 
As I said, I looked around at a lot of people's dream rosters for a brand new All-Stars, and almost everyone listed Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2. And that makes sense! Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3 were all PlayStation exclusives, so anyone from that series is on the table, and Pyramid Head is easily the most recognizable villain of that franchise. But he's another character that's kind of hard to figure out. I mean, everyone pictures Pyramid Head as being this big, brutal beast, but he's not. That's more of Nemesis from Resident Evil. Pyramid Head is more of a slow, creeping monster that's more about psychological scars than actual physical power. So, I'm not going to go with Pyramid Head. No, our candidate from the Silent Hill franchise is going to be what I believe is their most recognizable protagonist, Heather Mason. And you might hear that and think, but Heather Mason is just a normal person, how would she fight? True. Her normal attacks would really just be shoves and kicks, but for her specials, I say we essentially turn her into the embodiment of Silent Hill itself. Kind of like how Jill in Marvel vs. Capcom 2 or Frank in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 could summon out zombies or other monsters from their game, Heather would be able to summon out the various creatures from Silent Hill to stumble across the stage, and that would extend to her supers. For her level 2 super, she would summon out Pyramid Head, who would just slowly lumber back and forth across whatever platform he summoned onto. He wouldn't be a very quick threat, but he'd stick around for a long while, and if anyone got close to him, he would immediately swing his blade down and bam, they'd be done for. Essentially allowing her to put a giant trap onto the field that would wipe out anyone that gets near it that would just sit there for a long time forcing the other players to take that into consideration while they're trying to jump around the stage and avoid your regular attacks. And as I said, that would be her level 2 super. I know a lot of people would assume Pyramid Head, he's the biggest monster of the franchise, he has to be the level 3 super. No, 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 no. For her level 3, I've got two ideas. One, the entire screen would turn into Silent Hill itself. Just rust and disgusting growth forming over everything. And as long as this effect was active, your opponent would take much more damage. Or, we could get really crazy with it, and for her level 3, Heather could go into a magical girl transformation, turning into Princess Heart, the secret costume you could give her in the game, and she would start flying around the stage, blasting your opponents with energy beams. For anyone who never knew about this weird alternate costume, this must be super confusing to you, but despite being one of the best horror games in history, Silent Hill also has a fair share of weird crazy easter eggs. In fact, I say let's bring those easter eggs into this game. Give Heather Mason two endings to her arcade mode. The first one would be a normal ending. She goes back to Silent Hill, but now she's got a weapon from Ratchet and Clank that turns all the monsters into sheep, or she brings Kratos around with her to punch all the monsters for her. But then, if you play through her arcade a second time, and do enough secret stuff like finishing the match with a certain move or winning by timeout, something specific that would be hard to stumble onto, if you did this then she would get a second ending where she searches for who the mastermind is behind this whole battle royale. Who brought all these characters together, only to learn... And if you think that one was weird, then check this out. Here comes a new challenger. What can I say? Looks like I'll just have to take on the prince's legacy myself. And the title of Overlord! <laughs> Edna from Disgaea. Here's another problem that I had with the first All-Stars roster. It was very western based. Yes, it had a few characters from eastern developers, but the majority of them came from games either published here in the west, or designed to quote unquote, 
appeal to the West. And when I think of the PlayStation, I think of the console that kind of runs Japan. There are so many games out there with big audiences in Japan, and I feel like the first roster kind of ignored that. So I wanted to pick a long-running PlayStation exclusive series full of memorable characters that, while having fans in the West, was really big in Japan. Enter Disgaea, a series that has had a lot of PlayStation fans ever since the PS2 and has continued to stick around to this day. And I'm going with Etna, who was basically meant to be the mascot of that series since the start. She's a mischievous little devil who again would have a great personality to see clash with these other characters. And she's also got a close connection to the Prinnies, another mascot for the series, so she could have specials where she picks them up and throws them across the screen, or have a super where she commands them to charge as a long line of them run across the screen, kind of like Tron Bond serve bots in Marvel vs. Capcom. And speaking of Capcom... Here comes a new challenger! Come on! Let's turn up the heat! This is the path of my destiny. Round one. Fight! Ryu from Street Fighter. Okay, hold it. I know a lot of people right now are jumping at the screen and saying, you said these had to be characters with deep connections to the PlayStation. Street Fighter doesn't have that. True. Street Fighter has been on almost every console. It belongs to no one platform. That is, until Street Fighter V. Yes, Street Fighter V, the latest installment, was a PlayStation console exclusive. You know why? Because Sony actually helped to fund the production of Street Fighter V. So, starting with this generation of the series, Sony now owns some stock in Street Fighter. They actually do have a connection to it. So I say, take the face of not just Street Fighter, but the face of fighting games in general, and bring them in here. I mean, this is a crossover game. I think you're legally required to have a trailer of Ryu charging face first at someone for your crossover game. Also, for Ryu's ending, it has to be. It has to be him training with Chop Chop Master Onion from Parappa. Ah, yes. I see. Now I understand. Kick. Punch. It is all in the mind. And that brings our total to 19 characters, so we only have room for one more. And for our final contender, I am once again going to double up from a previous franchise, and this time, I mean that about as literally as you possibly can. Here comes a new challenger! Your mother's knife. It belongs to you now. What for? A test. She taught you to hunt, yes? Yes, sir. Then show me what you know. I am hungry. Kratos from God of War. That's right. For this new game, we're going to have two versions of Kratos. One from the original trilogy, and one from the new series. Why would I double up? Because A, as I said, Kratos is pretty much Mr. PlayStation. If any character deserves two spots, it's him, not, well, you know. But also because the old series and the new series have been big hits, but almost feel like completely different properties. You could go into the new God of War having never played any of the old ones, and you might be a little lost at one point, but you'd mostly be fine. And most importantly, because old school Kratos and new Kratos would play 100% differently. Old school Kratos would use his Blades of Chaos, his arrows, Medusa head, all the weapons he got from the Greek gods, but new Kratos would use his axe, ice spells, and have Atreus jump out and fire arrows and lightning attacks. Heck, old Kratos and new Kratos don't even have the same voice actor. You could totally make these two work as different characters. And as I said, each character would have their rival battles, so for Kratos' rival battle, imagine him climbing up a mountain, only to see his younger self standing at the top. Atreus asks his father who's that, and Kratos just says, A ghost from my past. One I must rid myself of in order to move on. 
In fact, speaking of the rival battles, listen, we're here, we're at the end of the roster, we listed off everybody, so how about, just for fun, just to go out, we actually figure out what those would be. I already said old Kratos and new Kratos, as well as Tifa and Kiryu. Next up, two super obvious ones, Ryu and Heihachi, and Crash and Spyro. Next, another fairly obvious choice, Jin and William would engage in a duel of samurais. Then we would have Carmelia Fox try and bring Nathan Drake to justice, while Sly Cooper steals an artifact right out from under Chloe's nose. Bring back the classic matchup of Jack and Daxter versus Ratchet and Clank. I mean, yes, we already did in the last game, but it works so well that it would totally be worth double dipping on this one. Elizabeth would challenge Yu Narukami to see if he had the power she was searching for to reawaken her persona protagonist. Dade, the demon slayer that he is, goes up against Etna. Sweet Tooth gets his car sliced up by Ryan because he thinks that it's a Metal Gear, and now Sweet Tooth is mad. Coco wants to get a closer look at Spike's tech, but he thinks that she's some new kind of ape. Have Cole McGrath face off with the Bloodborne Hunter, which sounds like an odd matchup, until you remember that Bloodborne Hunters drink blood to gain health, and in the infamous DLC, he literally faced off with vampires, so you could see an easy confusion breaking out there. Sir Daniel being the noble knight that he is. Well, sort of. Eh, to a degree, tries to protect Heather Mason, but she can't understand him and just thinks that he's another monster. Captain Quark tries to smooth talk his way out of a fight, but Abe sees his giant head and chest and sees him trying to hawk merchandise and thinks that he's a gluckin. Sackboy sees Parappa's sweet dance moves and he uses his world building powers to copy and paste his hat and skateboard, so Parappa assumes that he's stepping up to him for a dance off. Cat's gravity altering powers causes Fat Princess's cake to flow away and she wants revenge. And lastly, because of Cloud's exposure to Mako energy, Aloy's tech can see that he's got some weird earth energy around him and she wants answers. And that is all the rival battles. Although, it actually was tough picking who would go up against who because many of these characters could easily work against multiple opponents. Heihachi would work against Kiryu. Dante would work against Heather Mason. William, being from a Soulsborne style game, could go up against an actual Soulsborne character with the Bloodborne Hunter. And Ryu works against, well, pretty much anyone because if he's in a fighting game, he is going to punch whoever is in front of him. So as always, I have to throw out one crazy idea in these videos. Maybe we could give each character multiple rival battles. Remember how I mentioned Heather could get two endings depending on how you played? Maybe each character could have two different endings depending on whether or not you got a high enough score or if you did something special during their arcade ladder. And you would know if you got this second ending depending on which rival battle you unlocked. Also, speaking of the endings, if this game ever does come back, which believe me, I am aware that's probably not ever going to happen, but if it does ever come back, Please, I am begging you, do something better with your endings. The first game had multiple pieces of art for each character's intro, which was great, except each intro was just, hey, this is our normal life, and now we're going off to find something. Okay, that's fine. I mean, if you don't know these characters, it does actually serve as a really good introduction to each of them, and they did look nice, and they actually got a lot of the voice actors from these games to come back, so that was pretty darn cool. But then their endings were always just, and now we're done with that, so it's back to our normal lives, but some of us might have gotten some kind of a special power from all that fighting, it's kind of vague. This is a crossover game, darn it. Do something special with your endings. Have Fat Princess steal Sweet Tooth's truck, hoping there's ice cream inside. Have Dante mount the helmet of Pyramid Head up on his wall as a trophy. Have Jin trying to escape from Yarnum to try and get back home. I'm not going to go over every single character, but trust me, you could do something fun with them. And since this is a crossover game, I am begging you, do something fun with them. But there's one last question that we have to address. Who is the boss? The last game had... This. A giant pile of pixels. Which actually is not that bad. I mean, it's not a good fight, but this actually was originally going to be PlayStation's mascot until they realized, oh my god, that thing is not marketable at all, and they got rid of him. So it was kind of cool to see him come back and fight all the PlayStation characters. But yeah, we can do better. How about Dr. Cortex and Dr. Nefarious team up and take control of a Colossus from Shadow of the Colossus? You have to jump up various platforms attacking different parts of the Colossus while these two mad scientists fly past and try and blast you. 
I think it would be a great way to mix the platforming of the game along with two big PlayStation bad guys, as well as another beloved franchise that is kinda hard to fit in here anywhere else. And that is how we would build the roster for PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale 2. Damn, even after doing an entire video on it, that name is still way too long. But hey, as I said, this game had a lot of things that need to be fixed, but I hope today we at least created a fun new roster for the sequel that will never come. And of course, there's tons of other characters that we could throw in here as DLC, but I think we've done enough for today. Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Let me know what characters you would love to see in another PlayStation crossover game. And if you like this video and you want to see us construct more rosters for hypothetical fighting games, click that subscribe button, ring the bell, and share us around the web. It really is the best way to help us grow. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade or on Twitch at Professor Thorgy. Thanks again, everyone. Come back next time.